Hey everybody, it's Tony with Big T Bariatric, and today is Wednesday, February 22nd. I hope you're having a wonderful day so far. What I want to do today is talk about something a little different, and it might be controversial. Some of you might disagree with my takes on some of this, but hey, that's okay. I'm trying to create a conversation here, and that is around enabling. How does this happen, and, and why do people uh, seem to find someone to enable them? And let's just say it's pretty easy to do. And in my humble opinion, as someone who's been over 600 pounds and lived that lifestyle, I think it's impossible to get to that size without having someone in your life enable you to get there. Because let's face it, once you start crossing that 500 pound mark and you're pushing towards 600 or 700 or even 800 pounds, as we've seen some people on these shows who are that big, um, you begin to get to a point in your life where you are unable to do the things you normally did before. You become less and less sedentary, and so you rely on somebody else to do that stuff for you. You can't clean for yourself. You can't cook for yourself. You could barely take a shower, um, making food, going grocery shopping, doing normal day-to-day -day things is, is almost impossible. And it even gets to a point where you can't even work and do a normal job. And so we, we often ask when we watch these shows, I get a lot of comments from people saying, how can they afford to eat? How can they afford just being able to order out all the time? How do they afford to live in a place? I mean, we saw in yesterday's reaction video, you know, two people who lived in a van. But outside of that, most of these people have a place to live. They have somebody living with them. They have somebody buying food for them and cooking for them and ordering for them and all these things. And as time goes on, you know, all these different apps like Shipt or DoorDash or whatever, they make this process easier, right? So all you have to do is go to your front door. They'll bring the groceries to you. They'll, they'll bring the food from McDonald's to you. They'll do, you know, whatever they can to make a few bucks. And so... Enabling is one of these things that um, it, it's kind of a mystery too, but I'm going to try to dig into so sort of the science behind it, and I'm going to look at an article, but before that, I, I want to watch this video. Um, this is not for my 600-pound life, but it's Stephen Asante, audio of dad ordering pizza. This is all black screen, so you're not going to see anything, but Justin Asante recorded his dad, who was on the phone with Stephen, and Stephen was begging his dad for pizza, and his dad said, no, I'm not going to order pizza, but I'll get you a sandwich, and we'll actually see what happens. This is a classic enabling scenario right here. So, her wife then? She's pissed Well, I'll order you a chicken palm, that's it. Chicken palm from where? Domino's, I guess. You can tell right off the bat how Steven Asante is like, um, it's not what I want, Dad. I, I want something else. You're offering to get me a sandwich, really? It's like, uh, that's not what I want. What's your phone number? Why? Because you're going to bust my balls tomorrow, too, because you ain't going to have fucking food tomorrow, either. Correct? Instead of making sure Stephen has groceries, healthy groceries, he already knows that not only is he going to have to order food for his son today, he's going to have to order food for him tomorrow and the next day because he has no means of getting groceries. And so what? This is one of the classic signs. It's easier for his dad to just order him some food and give him what he wants versus putting in the effort of getting groceries because he knows Stephen, as we all know Stephen, right? He's going to throw a fit if he doesn't get what he wants. Fucking, fucking. Well, I can't blame her, but they cut. They're the ones that cut her fucking hours down. It's not her. It's them. They cut her. The days they cut. Like, she's only here three times a week. Well, I don't know. Apparently, Stephen has a home care, home care nurse who is helping him get groceries. And so this is part of why he's, he's begging his dad, right? Like, hey, my nurse isn't able to come in. She only comes in three times a week. I have no food right now. You know, it's just a bad situation. So 
Steven doesn't really have the help right now because of his size. He can't go grocery shopping. And so his dad, in some way, thinks he's helping his son, showing him love by ordering him some food because he doesn't have food. When instead, you know, he should be trying to get the, the nurse who does come over three times a week to do grocery shopping or whatever. You know, what's your fucking number? Hey, what's your phone number to? Let my, I got your phone number. No, you got my number. You call me all the time. Fucking Christ. Hold on, please. Uh, seven, seven. I'm only doing this so you don't go back to the fucking hospital and get put, put in fucking jail. Good <coughs> that. <coughs> 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 He's only doing this so he, his son doesn't go back to the hospital and, and ends up in jail. Like that part, I don't understand. I'm only doing this because he thinks he's trying to save his son from having to go to the hospital or going back to jail. But that doesn't make sense to me. Nothing's gonna happen. They're gonna think there's drugs in that fucking house. No, 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 Allison said no fucking pizza. What about the places that are over here? No, I'll have to do that tomorrow. I can't do that today. That's all done and over with. They don't work at night. Well, I don't need any soda, just a cheese pizza. No, you're not getting a pizza, John. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh... Uh, Steven's putting on the manipulation right here. He knows what he really wants is the pizza. He doesn't want no chicken parm sandwich, this little sandwich. He wants a full-sized pizza. And his dad starts to do the right thing and says, no, I'm not getting you pizza, but we'll see what happens. She said no fucking pizza. That's what's killing you. I mean, that's the thing. Like, his dad knows that the pizza is killing him. He knows that pizza is a lot more calories than a chicken parm sandwich. And so he knows what the problem is, but... John, I'll get you a fucking sandwich. Hold on, I'll call you right back. I never the call. Let me go. Just saying, 713. Yeah. I keep doing this to you, I'm sorry. Yeah. 713. <laughs> I like how Justin put the uh, word to your fake crying. And he probably is. Steven probably is putting on, on the tears right now. Because it's like... Maybe there is a part of Steven that, that realizes that he's taking advantage of, of his father here. But knowing Steven, probably not. He is putting on the fake tears because he really wants the pizza. He knows if he plays with his father's heartstrings and plays the violin and you know pretends like he's sad and oh you know i'm so sorry dad i keep doing this to you i keep putting you through this but that doesn't actually lead steven to changing his behavior right so we know it's fake we know that he knows how to get his dad to give him whatever he wants yeah in which one mind i know your fucking phone number You gotta go on a diet, John. I know, it's hard though. Okay, so the dad, I, I forget his name though, I'm sure they've said it, but the dad clearly knows his son is near death. He is morbidly obese. He is six, seven, eight hundred pounds at this point, right? He knows he needs to go on a diet. He knows he shouldn't be ordering him this food, the sandwich. But yet he's doing it anyways. So he could have ordered something healthy. I'm sure Domino's has a salad or something that he could have sent Stephen. But he's not doing that. Why? Let me go. Let me call him. Crocodile tears. Oh, shut the fuck up, you. They're not real. All right, because I'll tell Allison, send them back fucking home. Send them. So I don't have to fucking tolerate this fucking shit no more. Yeah. They're fake tears. He just wants a large pizza. He's not getting a large pizza. Yeah. Okay? So mind your fucking business. Yeah. And you can tell Alice to do it mind your fucking business. 
So the dad here realizes that he's caught, right? Like his son Justin caught him giving in to his son. And Justin's being smart. He's like, Dad, you know those are fake tears. Why are you giving in to him? Why are you giving him what he wants? You know you're killing him by enabling him. And so the dad just got angry and snapped at Justin. Like, shut the F up. Like, mind your business. So what do you buy him? I'm getting him a medium, not a large. Same shit. Kids gotta eat. Kids gotta eat, right? The kids gotta eat. So... He, he went from sort of laying down the, this boundary saying, I'm only going to get you a sandwich. I'm not getting you pizza. I'm not getting you pizza. He said it several times. And so he goes from that to his son, Bate crying and, you know, playing on his dad's heartstrings. Suddenly he's getting a pizza. It's not going to be a large pizza. So he, he thinks he's doing the right thing partially because he's not getting him a large, but he's still getting him a medium. And he says, kids got to eat. He doesn't got to eat. Like, the dude could probably not eat for several months and be okay. All right. Have a small or a sandwich. Just if you as big as him and you fucking ate like he did, you wouldn't want a fucking small either. <laughs> I mean, as somebody who's been that big, that's true. I wouldn't want a small. I wouldn't want a sandwich. I'd want a large cheese pizza. Well, I, I wouldn't eat just a normal cheese. I'd probably get one with, with the works on it, right? But, yeah, I mean, he, his, he's starting to break down here because he understands that what Steven really wants is a large cheese pizza. He thinks he's holding back a little bit by getting him a medium. But he should have gotten him a sandwich because a sandwich would have been smaller. He should have gotten a salad. He should have gotten something else. But he, he's sort of justifying his own behavior here. By saying, if you were as big as him, you wouldn't want that. Like, you would want to eat more food. So he's just sort of caught in between knowing his son needs to diet, but also knowing that he needs to eat. So shut the fuck up! You're controlling, he's not. You can record it all you fucking want, Justin. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> You're in control and he's not. Well, Justin obviously isn't in control because he needed the weight loss surgery as well. Or maybe this was after his weight loss surgery. I'm not sure. It shows the date here of 3-15-16. So um, I don't know if that's when Justin had a surgery or not. But um, that's not a, an excuse that he's not in control. So you help him remain out of control? Like you should be helping him, right? Because if it ain't him that's going to kill me, it's fucking you. Either one of you two are going to fucking kill me. And you so for him, it's much easier to just give in. He doesn't want to put up with Steven's antics. That's why Steven acts the way he acts. is because he knows it gets what he wants. He doesn't want his dad to, to give up on him and, and run away from him. So, he's giving him what he wants. Use a fuck if I fucking die, remember that. But you can control your fucking eating and he can't. That's not a reason to give in to him. Well, if they don't want me to order shit, have to have him go there and buy him food every fucking day. Not fucking three times a fucking week. How are you? Could I have a medium cheese pizza, please? A what? Medium cheese pizza. A medium cheese pizza? Yeah. Okay, is it for pickup delivery? Uh, delivery. What's your name and address? It's going to uh, 4045 Lakewood Drive. It should be in the computer, apartment 102. And that was a quick little clip there. The Asante brothers, Stephen yeah. and Justin, proved to be... <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I mean, he, he knows the right thing to do, but he doesn't do it, right? And he creates all kinds of scenarios in his head on why it's easier to give in, to give his son what he wants, but knowing he shouldn't have it. And so I found this article that talks about signs of enabling behaviors from family. 
And so I just kind of want to read through this and it sort of gives sort of different examples of what enabling behavior is. And so um, I might start here. What is enabling? Enabling occurs when the friends and family of a substance user support the addiction through thoughts and behaviors. People who enable act as a cushion for addicts, preventing them from facing the consequences of substance abuse. When family members enable their loved one's addiction, they lose respect for themselves and the substance abuser loses respect for them. So in that same way, like Stephen Asante lost respect for his father by treating him that way. He has no respect for his dad, right? If he did, he wouldn't treat him the way he does. And he knows he can manipulate his dad to the 10th degree or whatever you want to call it to get him to give whatever he wants. He has no respect for his dad. Ignoring the problem or engaging in enabling behaviors makes us lose self-respect because we know we're not doing the right thing. Enabling not only creates a permissive attitude toward drug use or food abuse or whatever, but also gives the addict no desire to seek treatment. So at, at the same time, when Steven's dad is yelling at him saying, you need to go on a diet, John, you need to do this, you need to do that. He knows at the same time that he's giving in to him. And, and that prevents him from really getting the help he needs. So on one hand, he's not helping his son. And he thinks deep down inside he is because he's not in control. He needs help. I need to help my son. I need to give him whatever he wants to make him happy. One, so he'll stop yelling at me. But also, what he's also doing is making it so Steven does not get help. What is Steven going to do if he doesn't get a pizza? He's going to keep calling his dad. He's going to keep yelling at him. And dad, you give me what I want. And there's many times like he's threatened, you know, I'll go to the news. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll, you know, create this big problem if you don't give me what I want. And so, but at the end of the day, if Steven gets what he wants, he does not need to get treatment because he knows he can just pull on his dad's heartstrings and he gets what he wants. Enabled addicts lose faith in themselves and do not respect loved ones and make it easier for them to continue using drugs. So signs of enabling behaviors from family. Loved ones may, oops. Loved ones may enable the addict because they feel responsible for causing the substance disorder. They often blame themselves for the addiction and try to make up for it by sacrificing time, money, and energy. So, for example, a parent. We can go to Steven's parent. Like, okay, I created this problem. Now this problem is there, they're out of control. And the only way that I can like feel sorry for them, I could show them love, is by giving them what they want. Whether that's drugs, whether that's food, whether that's whatever it is that they're addicted to. Like I'm blaming myself for creating this situation and I know what makes them happy. And I'm sorry for what I did to you. So here's some food, here's some money for whatever. Just you know, I'm going to help you out. You can come live with me. I'll take care of you. I'll enable you. I'll I'll give you whatever. And it's sort of just, a, you know, they, they blame themselves for it. Family members make these sacrifices to reduce their loved one's pain and suffering. But they often don't realize they're engaging in enabling behaviors that are barriers to recovery. So again, they feel bad. They feel guilty. I created this in you. You now have the substance substance abuse problem. It's because my family has a history of abuse, or I wasn't a good enough parent to you, or I didn't treat you the right way, and now you're an addict, and I'm so sorry. And so I'm going to make this sacrifice. I'm going to try to make it up to you by giving you what you want. And so um, enabling behaviors come in many forms. By recognizing and ceasing these unhealthy behaviors, family families can focus on getting their loved one proper treatment. So number one, denial. Denial is one of the primary behaviors that families adopt when they learn that their loved one is addicted to drugs. They refuse to accept the reality that their family member has a substance use problem. They convince themselves that treatment isn't necessary and the addicts will know how to control their drug or alcohol use. Um, yeah. Especially when it comes to food, it can be very easy to deny that they have an addiction to food. There's over, there, there's always this overwhelming thought that you can change at any time. All you got to do is go on a diet and you can lose weight, but you don't have to do that right now. We know you're trying. We, we see that you're, you try to go on diet and, and, and you fail and you know, you're not doing so well and you still need to eat. You still need some food. Um, so, you know, 
they can see somebody getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but they're in denial that there is an addiction to food there. Justification. Justification and, uh, and denial work hand in hand. Families often reject the problem, making up reasons to justify their loved one's addiction. For example, a family member may feel that it is fine for a loved one to use alcohol or drugs to cope after a stressful day at work. Parents may also believe the substance use is only temporary and will stop after a change in lifestyle, such as college graduation. I mean, that's totally understandable too, right? Like, we all understand that we grab something to help us cope with stress or to celebrate. Like, food might be a huge deal in some people's families. It's part of their tradition, you know, for example, an Italian family. Like, I've watched a lot of videos from Italian families who love food, who, you know, get together as families and they make all this wonderful food and it tastes great. And there's a huge tradition behind that that goes back generations and generations. Um, but, you know, in some families, you know, food can be, you know, something you get everybody together. You have a big barbecue. It's something that happens regularly. Um, so it's very easy to justify somebody getting bigger and bigger and saying something like, oh, they just have a slower metabolism than everybody else. Or just coming up with some kind of excuse for why they have it. Oh, they're just going through a difficult time right now. For me, it might have been, oh, you just lost your dad. And so... Nobody really said anything to me about me getting bigger and bigger. Um, so, yeah, there's this idea that it might be temporary. They will get the help they need eventually. They will realize what they're doing to themselves. And, and in reality, it, they don't. It really takes them hitting rock bottom for them to realize what's going on. Allowing substance abuse. Family members may think they are controlling the situation if they allow their loved one to use drugs at home. They may even consume drugs or alcohol with the addict to manage their intake level and to make sure they gravitate toward home when using instead of more dangerous locations. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's just one of those situations where you think it's easier and better for them to do it at home under supervision, under the, the so-called care of the person who's enabling them, than for them to be alone and just out of control. So if you're ordering food for somebody and, you know, again, the big question, how can they afford all this? A lot of them have people ordering for them and buying food for them. And because they think you're living at home, we can control it. We can try to convince you at some point to get help, even though you're just out of control right now. Suppressing feelings. Not expressing your concerns about addiction to a person you love gives them a reason to keep using, and in some cases, substance users dismiss their family's fears by reassuring them that they will not consume drugs or alcohol. When an addict dismisses these fears and concerns, it may encourage family members to keep their feelings to themselves. So, I mean, yeah, we just saw a clip of Stephen's dad yelling at him, saying, you need to go on a diet. You need to fix this. But how often does he really say that? He, he gives in to him because he would rather suppress his feelings over it and give his son what he wants because it's easier to deal with rather than um, saying, hey, I'm going to help you go on a diet. I'm going to order some healthy food for you. I'm going to make sure you get some healthy groceries that you can make some food yourself. And so, you know, really, they're just suppressing the issues and in the same way avoiding the problem by ignoring the problem and not confronting the substance use your family members may feel that they are keeping the peace in their home instead of getting their loved one proper treatment the family focuses on keeping up appearances to look normal yeah that's a big deal like you don't want anybody to think there's a problem in your household that there's disunity within the family and so if you don't confront the substance abuse user or the food addict or whatever you know, they think they're just keeping the peace. Just like Steven Asante's dad ordered him the pizza to keep the peace. He didn't want a big fight. He didn't want his son to threaten to call the news. He didn't want any problems at all. He just wanted to give in to him because it was easier to do that than to get him the help that he needed. Protecting the family's image. The stigma of abuse 
use is ever present. People may be ashamed of their substance abusing family member, leading them per to portray the person in a falsely positive light to friends, coworkers, and acquaintances. So that's part of it too. Um, not so much in the food industry or the food addiction area because if you have somebody who's over 600 pounds, they're not really leaving the house as much. Um, so there's no need to really protect the family's image, but yeah. That can be part of the problem too, because if your child ends up leaving because they're not getting what they want and they throw a fit or whatever, you know, that can be embarrassing if, if, if somebody finds out about that. Minimizing the situation. People surrounding the addict may lighten the issue by convincing themselves that the substance user could be in worse situations. They treat the addiction as a phase that will improve on its own with time and patience. Yeah, we already sort of covered that. Like, you know, it's, it's much easier to do it at home under supervision. We're going to try to do our best to make sure he gets his help. We're going to try to get him into a bariatric program. We're going to try to encourage him to eat better. And it, it's better than allowing him to be on his own, living on his own, and just being out of control. So, you know, it's something they think they can work out with time. Playing the blame game. Adopting negative attitudes towards substance use users only pushes those struggling with addictions away. Blaming or punishing individuals for the substance use alienates them from their family, which may result in destructive behaviors. I've played the blame game before. There was times when I didn't do well on the scale. You know, I'd, I'd go to the bariatric clinic and I might have gained weight that month. And then I'd get mad at my mom. And I'd be like, Mom, you enabled me to eat this way. Like, why are you doing that? Why... Are you, you know, because there would be times where if she wanted something, she knows that I have the money, right? So it's, um, hey, I want an ice cream. I want to order something. And so she would sort of enable me in that way so that I would order food. And then later on, I'd get angry and I'd be like, why are you doing, why did you do that? Like, I was still in charge, right? I had the money. I paid for it. I, I ordered it still. I ate it still. So it's still 100% my responsibility for causing my weight gain. It wasn't my mom's. I should have said no. But at the same time, you know, there is a negative attitude towards those struggling with addiction. And, you know, it could be easy to blame or punish others and find yourself alienated from the family. Assuming responsibilities. Family members may be inclined to take over the regular tasks and responsibilities of the addict in an effort to prevent their life from falling apart. Instead, assuming responsibilities and providing money to the substance user removes accountability and allows them to fully indulge in their addiction. So, yeah, that's a big one, too. Um, and it goes along the lines with the other ones that we were talking about. Like, hey, we're going to try to make your life as comfortable as possible. We know you're going through a bit uh, a hard time. We know you're dealing with it through food. So we're going to try to do our best to get you some help. But the only way to do that is to keep your life from falling apart. So we're going to give you money. We're going to help you do this. We're going to order food for you. And, you know, that just in the end is not a good idea. Controlling behaviors, exerting control on a substance user may worsen their addiction. Constantly treating the addict as an inferior or placing numerous restrictions on their lifestyle may drive them further away from the family unit and closer to their substance using partners. So that's part of it too. It's like if I don't give in, if I don't give them what they want, they're just going to leave. They're going to go do it on their own. And so um, we're going to control you by giving you what you want. So um, let's see if there's anything else. Addiction, codependency, and other risks of enabling. Addiction is a disease that affects not only substance users, but also their families. A dysfunctional family dynamic may contribute to a codependence between an addict and family members. Enabling a loved one with addiction allows the substance use disorder to flourish. People surrounding the addict need to set proper boundaries to make sure that the disease does not engulf them as well. Patricia Postanowitz a faculty, a faculty member and addiction expert at North Central University School of Marriage and Family Sciences understands the difficulties families face when living with someone suffering from a substance use disorder. 
On the university's blog, she explains that the experience can be stressful and even traumatic for family members. Family members living with an addict are at risk for substance abuse because they may abuse drugs to cope with feelings of stress, anxiety, and depression. Um, I think I'm going to leave it right here. Okay, how, how to help. That certain family members can help a substance user by ceasing harmful behaviors. By identifying and changing their enabling behaviors, families can give their loved one a chance to recover from addiction. In addition, there are several steps families can take to improve the addict's likelihood of attaining sobriety. So they can attend meetings. Um... I have to talk about how important it is to find a support group if you're trying to lose weight. It's going to be very hard to do it on your own. Um, I said in yesterday's video that you know if someone is trying to diet, but there's they live with a family who's eating like garbage, that it often takes the whole family deciding to eat better for the addict in order to not be enabled as much, right? And some people did not agree with that. They were like, well, it's, you know, it's the individual that needs to figure out their problem. It's not the rest of the family. But how are you going to fix your problem if you're surrounded by people who are eating like garbage? Like, it's going to be impossible. And so you need a support group. You're not going to get that support at home. Everybody's going to eat how they want to eat. They're going to order out around you. You're going to smell it. You're going to be enticed. It's going to be very, very difficult. So you're going to need support from somewhere else. There's going to be boundaries that need to be set. Addiction can cause a ripple effect on the family and close family and close friends of a substance user. Family members should set clear boundaries with the addict to minimize stress and prevent drug seeking behaviors. So you can't keep giving in to that person. You have to set boundaries around them and say, you know what, this is becoming a problem. You're a strain on the family. We're spending so much more money on food. We're ordering you food all the time. And, you know, there's got to be a way to do it. That's not going to risk the other person leaving and finding out ways to get the food on their own. Stop making excuses. Making excuses for an addict encourages them to indulge in substance abuse. Some ways family members can make excuses for an addict include providing false reasons for missed work or events, financing their addiction, and allowing their addiction to dictate the family's plans. Even if it is difficult to say no to a loved one, remaining firm and refusing to enable the disease will help them recover faster. How much better would Steven be today if his dad did not enable him for so many years? All he has to do is call his dad up, fake cry, tell him I'm sorry, I, I keep doing this to you, and he gets what he wants. But if Steven's dad said no a long time ago, stopped ordering him the pizza, stopped ordering him the crap food, and got him going on, on a real diet, and he laid that boundary down, refusing to help him, how much quicker would he have recovered? And he wouldn't have developed this attitude of, if I throw a fit, I'm going to get what I want. So you could also participate in family therapy, um, commit to treatment, and all those other things. So anyway, this is my video for today on enabling the science behind it. Um, signs of enabling behaviors from family. There's a whole list of reasons why family members enable one another. And, um, yeah, it, it could be anything from um, just being in denial over it or thinking that you're actually helping them by preventing them from getting the, the substance outside of the family home um, and thinking that you're loving the person and also just wanting to avoid a big fight if they don't get what they want. So, um, anyway, I hope this video helps you understand um, some of the science, some of the psychology behind enabling and why it happens. But let me know what you guys think down below. Leave a comment. Leave a like. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to my channel. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. God bless you.